Welcome to Wizards Institute, the number one community to learn smart investing and financial independence. Ken is the president and founder of KRI Properties, a leading property management firm in Florida, currently managing over 2,000 doors. Ken has more than 23 years of real estate, private equity, banking, and principal investing experience. He has closed transactions in excess of $1.5 billion, much of it in acquiring, managing, and financing various multifamily real estate projects, as well as playing a significant role in the due diligence for institutional investors. Ken is a CPA with deep tax and accounting experience, as well as having owned several Cessna pilot training centers previously. Ken shares with us his views on the latest multifamily apartment market, updated from his perspective as a property manager for the nation, but especially Central Florida. We discuss rent and occupancy, sales and transaction trends, best practices of landlords and managers, as well as contemplate the short, mid, and long-term future of the market. So let me uh, get started here. Uh, bear with me, I'm not the best technical person you'll ever meet. So, um, San wanted me to first start out by talking a little bit about myself, which I'm not very good at. Um, so I had to put it down on the slide just to make sure that uh, uh, I was at least consistent and, and concise. So uh, again, my name is Ken Gee. I'm the founder and the managing member of the KRI group of companies. Uh, the primary companies carry properties, which most of you, if uh, if you've had work with us, uh, you're familiar with. I started the company about 23 years ago, um, and I'm proud to say it's now grown into a fully integrated, vertically integrated, self full service uh, real estate company. So we own, we syndicate just like you do, and uh, we manage uh, multifamily properties. I've owned about a thousand units in Florida and Ohio uh, myself. And uh, our senior management teams manage more than 15,000 units. About 11,000 of those are in Florida. So we've got some pretty deep experience in Florida. Um, my background personally, I'm a CPA. Used to work for Deloitte for seven years. Uh, when I was there, I did uh, some federal tax work, some state and local tax work, and spent most of my time in the merger and acquisition world, uh, working with private equity firms. Um, I uh, then spent seven, well, prior to that, I spent seven or uh, five years as a commercial loan officer with a company that uh, is now part of PNC. So I made uh, uh, small business loans, one to $5 million. Uh, and I, that's where I spent most of my time there until the recession came. <laughs> um, I'm licensed real estate broker in, in Florida and Ohio. You have to do that in order to, to manage property legally in both of those states. Um, in my previous life, actually right before 9-11, uh, I bought three Cessna pilot centers and uh, grew those. Uh, actually, I, I bought one and grew it to three locations. And uh, we operated a part 141 school, uh, through, uh, w which was administered by the FAA or, or managed by the FAA. And uh, basically, we took people from pilot, pilot, private pilot all the way up to the Delta um, uh, system. So we were, we were proud to do that. I sold that about three or four years after I bought it. Um, grew up in Toledo. Um, of course, I'm a licensed private, single engine, nothing fancy. I was never a commercial pilot. Uh, scuba dove, haven't done that in a while. Uh, member Vistage, I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. That's a CEO peer group, which if you haven't uh, looked into, as long as you don't mind spending the money, it's an excellent uh, peer group to, uh, uh, when you get to our level at the top of the company, there's nobody really to give us a lot of feedback and help us with our problems. And uh, that's really what that a group exists for. And it does, I, so far I've, uh, I've only been there a few months and I'm thrilled to have uh, joined. Very, very helpful. Um, personally, I love to read, spend tons of time with my kids, although they're out of college, one's in college, uh, two's in college actually, one's out of college. So now they start to like me again, finally, a little bit. Um, I serve as their ATM and, uh, <laughs> and I, uh, I, I enjoy growing my business, which I'm sure you guys uh, do as well. I have married three kids and uh, well, prior to the virus, I was easily splitting my time 50-50 Florida, Ohio, probably 60-40 Florida, Ohio. So uh, I'm supposed to go back uh, in the next couple of days. We'll see. The, the, the numbers are getting really rough, so we'll see what happens here. Um, Sand already went through the agenda, so I won't, uh, I won't spend much time on that. So why multifamily? Um, 
This is, uh, this is a really good question. Um, I'll tell you the obvious reasons. One, I like diversified income streams. So let's compare that to, I don't like warehouse, I don't like single tenant facilities because you were either doing really well or you're doing really bad. Um, I don't like that dichotomy. I prefer to have that diversified income stream and you get it from all the different residents. And those residents, if you're in the right area, give you exposure to many different employment uh, industries, which is important to me. I, I like, and as you get to know me more and more, I'm a pretty risk averse person. That's why I'm in apartments. That's why I do what I do. It's, it's a pretty safe place to be, relatively speaking. Um, in the, in the multifamily world, you get a lot less exposure to uh, economic cycles because people need a place to live. Um, right now, I, you know, I would not want to be in a multi-tenant office facility with expiring leases because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of companies that are downsizing. Because if, if nothing else in the short term, they've learned that they can run differently. They can operate differently, don't need so much space. Um, you know, all, when I think about all the different asset classes, retail, I wouldn't want to be in the retail space right now uh, because everything's going to online. Um, this is everywhere I looked when I started doing this 20 some years ago, I couldn't find a safer place to be, especially knowing that I could get returns 15, 20, 25, 30% annualized returns. And in some cases better if you're able to really leverage yourself. So that's, th that was really what drove me to, to, to this asset class. If I can be relatively safe, relatively secure, and still earn high returns, well, that's what you want. That, that's, that's what you're looking for. Uh, the next point, it's not incredibly obvious uh, when you just think about this business, but one of the things that I've always been a believer of is one of the, one of the things that you need in order to get some sort of pricing power, pricing leverage, is you've got to get people emotionally connected, right? They're not necessarily connected to an office space. They're not necessarily connected to a medical facility or a retail store. Or maybe it's a little mom and pop store they're very proud of. But when you look at people that are renting from us, if we can find a way to emotionally connect with them, that gives us an advantage. Not only, not only closing the sale, closing the, the lease, but it gives us some additional pricing power. And I'm not telling you we can double price because of it, but I like when we manage properties to find a way to emotionally connect them. And people are connected to their home. They're going to, it's their family that, that is going to be in that home. So they're emotionally connected. Um, which asset class should you invest in? I don't know. I don't remember saying if you asked me this question, but I think it's an important one because, um, you know, when we, when I started buying, when I started managing, I could have gone for a, D. Let me tell you, I have managed A's. I've not owned any. I have managed and owned D properties. They are no fun. Please stay away from them. Mm. They're just no fun at all. Um, <clears throat> the BC market is where I stay. I know it's where Brad wants you guys to be. And if for no other reason, just think about the mechanics of the, of the macroeconomics, right? So our businesses, it starts off with supply and demand. Um, I really see this because I grew up, this company grew up in Cleveland, and now we spent the last 10 or 12 years in Florida. I couldn't have found a more opposite macroeconomic picture. In Cleveland, you have declining demand and relatively stable supply. What's gonna happen with price? It's got to, think back to your, to your college days. Well, in Florida, you've got the exact opposite. You've got rising demand and you've got relatively stable supply. Now you say, wait a minute, they're building like crazy in Florida. How can you say the supply is stable? They're building A properties. They're not building BC properties. They just can't, they can't afford to. Um, so they can add all the A properties they want. Um, those properties are gonna, the, the, the market and the A market, the 1,800, 2,000, 2,500 a month properties um, most people moving to Florida can't afford that. Some can, but most can't. Most are looking for BC type properties, nice neighborhoods, decent neighborhoods, um, and decent housing. That's where I like to be because I have, I have a defined supply and I have growing demand. And that gives me, you know, I call it, you're not fighting the tape. If you're trying to make money in Cleveland going long 
in Cleveland while you're fighting the tape, right? Try going long in a bear market. It's really hard to make money in the stock market. In Florida, you're, you're making money in a bull market and that's not likely to change anytime soon. So that's why I like BC market or BC assets. I think that's uh, exactly what Brad wants you guys to do. And uh, he would be dead on right. By uh, the way, so, sorry, Ken, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, just uh, maybe from a process standpoint, um, if questions pop up, maybe the audience can just type the questions in. And so, and then I think Ken's presentation is relatively short. We'll go through the entire thing and then we'll go into a discussion with the questions. Thank you, yeah, Ken. Is that okay? Good idea. Um, all right, property management companies. Now, you know I'm a, I am own a property management company, so you know the position I'm gonna make here. I'm gonna tell you it's not a commodity, commodity it's a critical partner, right? But it, it's really true. Um, you know, we talk to a lot of different, I talk to a lot of different people that are looking at hiring property management companies. It's not everybody um, would take the same position about the value proposition that property management companies bring to the table. They look at it more as a commodity and commodities, you should just drive down the price and get it as cheap as you can. Um, whether, you, whether you hire me or not, uh, I would submit to you that that's probably not a way to good, a, a good way to approach the property, your property management partner. And here's why, and if any of you have read our marketing materials, you know that I advocate that real estate, um, they sell it as a passive activity, but it's not. Uh, somebody has to operate it, it's a business, it's no different than any other business you would open up. Um, a retail store, a uh, professional services firm, a restaurant, a bar, a any, any business, it's, it's exactly like what we do here in, in the apartment world. We have marketing issues we have to deal with, we have employees we have to deal with, we have customers, we have sales, we have money, we have internal controls, um, well, some, we have payables, we have an entire accounting system that we have to have. So I want you to think about real estate as a business. Please don't think of it as a passive activity that is literally just collect the rent and move on because it's in order to do it right and do it successfully, you really got to do more than that. And you really have to treat it as a business. And that's what we push, push down through our entire company the entire time with all of our regional managers and our property managers. There are a few things that would uh, cause your investment to fail. The first is that you grossly overpay. And I've seen people do that. It happens. Um, I would say in Florida. Hey, Peter, I'm listening. In Florida, you, uh, you can get away with overpaying much better than you can in other markets because you can grow your way out of it. Um, you can buy into a declining neighborhood. And yeah, there are declining neighborhoods in Florida. Um, there are far fewer than they are in other parts of the country. But you know that's certainly one way to lose money in this business. Um, you can have poor capital management. You cannot capitalize the property properly, and people do try to do that. Um, sometimes I see that happen where they won't. You know they don't they don't raise any reserves. They don't have any reserves. It was all they could do to get the, the deal closed. Those are all recipes for a disaster. Or you can hire the wrong property management company, and they can drive it into the ground. And they do. And I see it happen. Uh, not every day, but I see it happen a lot. Um, it's because in order to be successful, property management companies have to be committed. They have to take what they're doing seriously and they have to treat it like a business. Think about, I'm pretty sure if I asked you, if you were to go out and buy a restaurant, a grocery store, <coughs> excuse me, a professional service firm, um, I don't know, any uh, uh, a retail store, would you hire a company to just come in and do everything for you? That's just not heard of, right? No one would do that. They start those companies because they view it as a business that they're going to run. Real estate is no different. You don't have to run it. You just, and there are property management companies that can do it. You just got to choose carefully. So do yourself a favor and do really good research on that. And I'm trying up here. Give me one second. And again, if it, whether you hire us or not, please make sure your property management company understands what you're trying to do, understands your strategic plan, and knows how to implement that. That's the important part. Um, the markets, let's talk about the markets. I don't follow a ton of national um, uh, metrics. I don't because almost all, all real estate is mostly all local. 
I mean, of course, some of the, the major things, and we'll talk about those in a second, will uh, affect your investment. But, you know, if I put one property in Cleveland, I put that very same property in, in the middle of Tampa, Florida, it's going to have a completely different result every single time. Um, I do, however, follow the credit markets very closely, especially now, but you have to do this. You have to understand where the credit markets are all the time because they're going to impact how you're going to be able to get a deal. I follow Fannie, I Fred, follow Freddie, I follow the CMBS markets, uh, and I'm assuming everybody in this call understands those markets and, and knows what I mean by that. Um, I will tell you that now they're starting to open up. I think, as you know, I, you know, I always say when things like this happen, there's a pendulum that swings, right? And the, you know, in March, April, the pendulum swung way, swung way over. And, uh, you know, the lenders really, really tightened up. And you could get a deal done, but you were gonna be at 65% uh, leverage and you're gonna have 12 months worth of principal and interest uh, escrow required. That's pretty rough. Uh, and the spread was wider <laughs> to accommodate for the lower interest rates. Um, that has reduced somewhat. The last I heard, there were about six months of reserves and it's changing. I don't know if it's going to uh, get a little tighter with the numbers that they're seeing all over the country, especially in Florida. We'll have to see. Um, but it is, it, the, the important thing that I take away from this is that, you know, like always, they overreacted and it's coming back slowly. We just need to wait till it becomes palatable. Now you can get those money, those funds out of escrows if you meet certain debt service coverage requirements and things like that. So in terms of getting a deal done, I don't mind putting the money in as long as I can get it back out and it's my money <clears throat> and it's not going to evaporate. Uh, so uh, those, that's not an impediment to me getting a deal done. Um, I follow the national laws very closely. And why? Because they affect the business operations of the property, really. Um, FFCRA, most people don't talk about that, but that's a law that protected employees that were infected, uh, affected by COVID, um, where, you know, if they, I think uh, memory serves me, if they got the virus themselves or had to take care of an immediate family member, we had to pay them for two weeks. Um, if they have a child at home and they met certain other requirements, <coughs> excuse me, they had to uh, be paid for an additional 10 or 12 weeks. Um, kind of pretty, pretty difficult. And uh, your property had to pay them. I mean, that was just the law. Um, the CARES Act, um, there's all kinds of provisions associated with that. The most important one that I follow, of course, is the eviction moratorium. So everybody understands, hopefully, what that is. If you're a covered property, meaning you had some connection to the federal government, Fannie Loan, Freddie Loan, HUD Loan, uh, Section 8. Uh, if that was the case, you couldn't evict anyone for nonpayment, and you can't until July, I think, 27th. Um, the next law, of course, everybody is, it's all over the news, is the PPP program. I will tell you uh, that in the beginning, it was the belief by most real estate people that they couldn't get a PPP loan. And uh, I will submit to you that almost all of our clients have them. Um, so, you know, initially some of them got turned down. But like anything, um, if you uh, just try, try again, you get it done. And that's what most of our clients did. So. Um, I know there's the ever-changing rules relating to that. Um, the new law that I'm following right now, I don't know if you know, it passed the House. I don't know if it was today or yesterday, but very recently. Um, it's, it's a provision. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know what they were calling it yet. It's, uh, the Senate hasn't, it doesn't look like it's going to pass in the Senate. But the, the important component for us, there's about $100 billion uh, set aside to help people uh, with affordable housing but it also extends the eviction moratorium till March of 21, which is a little rough as you can well imagine. Um, hopefully it doesn't go through the Senate because I don't really, I don't like that law as you can well imagine. Um, so uh, I do follow that law pretty carefully um, and we'll see what happens. Hopefully, uh, you know, I've encouraged uh, our clients who are part of the branch group that, you know, if, if there's something that, you know, I believe that you can make a difference uh, by reaching out to your local uh, or your uh, elected politicians. And I would recommend that you do that. In fact, uh, we have somebody here from Orlando's, uh, one of the Orlando deals. Um, one of the commissioners in Orange County, I think it was, uh, decided that they wanted to put on the November ballot a, a rent freeze. 
And so we got word of that through the Orlando Area Apartment Association. Uh, we wrote in, um, and uh, one of your one of your members, the sponsor of the deal, he listened in on the live virtual meeting, and uh, they read our comments aloud. There were thirty comments aloud, and uh, ours were read aloud as well, and it and it went down. So I do believe that it matters if if enough people make enough noise. Um, right now, for some reason, landlords have a target on their back. I, I don't know why, but they do. Uh, with respect to uh, supporting others. Um, economic indi indicators, the, the big ones I follow are mostly employment related. You know, right now, I don't, I don't know this, incredibly useful because employment went through the roof. We all know that. I think the unemployment numbers are probably still skewed. Um, Florida's system was broke um, just because people couldn't get uh, into the system to even claim their unemployment. What I care about there is a trend, and I think it's starting to tar starting to go down. Hopefully, that you know the numbers that are happening right now don't affect that. Uh, we don't need that. We can't go back to a shutdown. We we just can't. So uh, that's that's how I follow the national market. Again, I you know I, I focus primarily on the employment stuff because that's what matters. Um, Central Florida. Uh, now it, it's interesting because the story throughout Florida. It depends a little bit on where you are, but it also depends a lot on how you operate the property. And that's what I've learned as I've talked to various people in this business. Um, right now, we're still able to get market rents as we define them pre-COVID. And in fact, in many cases, we continue to raise rents. Um, our properties are full. Um, I am really a lunatic about occupancy. Even when we're renovating, I wanna keep your properties full. The reason I do that is because why not? It's free money. Um, you're, you're not gonna have to worry about how fast you turn units in Florida. 40% of the people move every year, no matter what. It's just a very transient area. So you're not gonna have to worry about not having enough units to renovate so that you could get your rents up. Uh, that's never been a problem. So I hyper-focus on staying full. So when we generally attack a value add program, We'll take the existing people that are there, give them modest rent increases so we don't drive them out, let the people that are naturally going to move, which is 40% of the property, which is plenty, and then we, we move the property that way. And, and when we renovate or turn the unit, we'll release it at the market rents. It becomes completely painless. There's no calls for rent freezes because the landlord is you know jacking the rent up $150, $200. Uh, we achieve our goal and there's no noise because the new person coming in, it's advertised at whatever the new price is and they're no worse, you know, it, it, it's easily done without any trouble. So I'm hyper-focused on occupancy. Now managing through COVID has been particularly challenging. Um, if you, if I look at it from a high level, late March, we went into defense mode and in a few properties, we even reduced rents whatever it took to get full. Um, then as, as March or April came, that was the rough month. May came, got better. Now we started to feel better, right? As we are uh, all starting to open back up. Since probably late May, we are, uh, I would say early June, we, we made that transition back to offense and back to implementing the strategic plans that, that our properties were intended to, to follow. So that's the path we're on now. And so, <clears throat> During that time, I wanted to make sure that we came out of it full. We don't know how long that we didn't know how long it was going to take. But what I, what you don't want to do is put yourself in a situation where you have weak occupancy, because you, you're weak. You're weak then. You can't do anything with with anything. Um, so um, I do see now some concessions creeping back into the market because what happened was, it was a the management world was very dichotomous. You either figured out a way to keep your office open, or you literally put a sign on the door, closed, see you after the virus. And so many of our properties, uh, if you go to all the competition, nobody could get anyone. They couldn't find a leasing person. They couldn't talk to anyone. They just couldn't. Well, we really took a hard look at, all right, how can we continue to operate and keep our doors open? Because we're taking care of people's homes. I don't, you can't just abandon the place. So we kept people there. We took extra steps with masks and PPE and, and disinfectant and only allowing one person in the office at a time, doing virtual tours, 
virtual Zoom leasing, believe it or not. We implemented all kinds of things like that, allowed us to stay open. So during the time when everyone was uh, shut, uh, you know, shut down, and some of the properties are still shut down, we were just cleaning house because they didn't have anybody else that could take care of them. So um, now those places are starting to open back up. They have suffering occupancy. So now we're competing a little bit with those properties trying to lease themselves back up and they're using concessions to try to do it. So it's not a big thing. I think the biggest I've seen is a half a month. It's not, you know, but in Florida, it's, you know, in the world of Florida multifamily, that's a significant uh, uh, concession. Um, collections. Um, I think I talked a little bit about that. They were definitely low point in April and they've continued to trend up every month since then. Um, what is important is that we're creative about how we handle it. Um, we've reinvented the way we kind of manage that whole side of our business because we can't simply serve a three day and take them to court. You just can't. So we're doing lots of uh, creative things to um, deal with, well, to, to make sure we take good care of the people who legitimately need it and are good solid people. Um, and then find out who the, the bad guys and gals are and we deal with them very differently. Uh, but you know, as, as a management company, you've got to get revenue producing units in place for your, for your owners. Um, hey, um, mm -hmm. Oh, so, sorry. I, I, I thought it would be good to maybe pause there uh, after the Central Florida. I see you have one more slide. and mm -hmm. there are some good questions there? Uh, but maybe I'll, you can finish this uh, Florida slide first, and then we'll, we'll dig into some of the questions if you don't mind, Ken. Yeah, no, that'd be great. So <clears throat> I kind of alluded to this. If you're doing it right, I, I, your occupancy is fine. If you closed your doors and went home, your occupancy is terrible high 80s, low, very, very low 90s. Uh, most of our properties are full. Um, and again, as a management company, we have been and will continue to be very successful or very proactive, excuse me, um, because I have to be. Now the numbers are going back up again. So now I have to adjust even more. And we're continuing to monitor this stuff every week. Every week on our internal calls, we decide what is our posture now? What are we doing? What are we focused on? And, uh, you know, as you're running a company managing multiple different properties with, you know, these people have 50, 60 things coming at them all the time. It's my job to make sure they stay focused on the things that matter. And that's what I think has helped us get through this. Um, Sam asked me to talk a little bit about sales and transaction trends. I mean, clearly the, the, the velocity of buy and sell is down significantly. And it's down mostly because people couldn't get to Florida to look at the properties. Um, I had a couple properties we were preparing to put on the market. I pulled them off um, just because I'm not going to take a hit um, just because there's no buyers out there who can come and see the property. And that's happening. Uh, the buyers and the sellers that are out there in the market, buyers are looking for a discount because of COVID. The sellers that are selling either A, don't really care if they sell or they're, they're under duress. And so you'll have buyers now ready to take advantage of that. So for the most part, though, there's a pretty good expectation gap. Um, the market was loosening up. In fact, a couple brokers, I keep in touch, close touch with them. They were starting to bring some deals out, but now they're nervous because, you know, with Florida's numbers spiking, they're not sure anybody's going to come and tour these things. So we'll have to see. So, Sand, you have some questions? Absolutely. I'm not sure where to yeah, find them. Uh, or yeah. You name, you know, let, let's let's take a pause to discuss. So, so if you don't mind, maybe unshare the screen so we can see everybody's handsome and pretty faces. Yeah. Um, there's a question from Jim. Uh, I think I just want to deep uh, uh, dive deeper and tap into your expertise here, Ken. I think uh, there were a few newbies that registered, but from what I'm seeing, the folks on, on here are fairly experienced, certainly much more experienced than me. And so um, do you mind unsharing the screen? Yep, let me figure so out how to do that. Bear with me. Okay, let me see. Oh. <laughs> uh, Let's see here. I, I guess, Stop share. There we go. Sorry okay, about that. Okay, great, great. All right. So we can see everyone's faces. Yeah, there's a question from Jim in terms of what, once all the subsidies are gone, maybe you could share your views on what, what happens because uh, COVID has spiked, right? Uh, a lot of the uh, wishful thinking that it's going to go away in the summer or the heat actually obviously is not happening. Um, so what what's your view uh, on, on going forward, uh, some of the subsidies uh, subside? Okay, so when you you refer to subsidies, you're you're talking about the stimulus checks and things like that. Yeah. That's so right. I know that 
part of uh, the law that I think passed the House was more stimulus for people, uh, more money for, for the people. Um, that's the first thing. Second, here's my point. I don't think it's going to go away that soon. Secondly, I think we have another month left on the unemployment bonus payments, um, which are putting people in pretty good positions. So what, here's what's interesting. Um, I put our, our resident base into three buckets. The first bucket is the people that were relatively unaffected. Um, they can find a way to work from home, just like many of us are doing right now. And so they can, they're still earning money and they can still make their rent payments. And they do just like they always have. The second group is the group that did get laid off. They're working at a restaurant, a bar, you know, Disney, Orlando's heavily affected by Disney. Um, uh, or, the, you know, they've, they've gotten laid off, but they're good people. They just need some help. And when they get stimulus checks, they're going to put some of that money towards rent. Um, we're, we really bend over backwards to work with those people because that's what we should do. That's the right thing to do. The third bucket of people are the people that they are not going to pay. They refuse to pay. They believe they're covered by the law and they respectfully tell us to stop bothering them. So what we do in that situation is, uh, th and that's the situation that is going to be a problem for, I, I don't view it as a huge problem because unemployment is going to continue to go down. The, the, the subsidy payments are going to the people that were affected. They're, if they're more than, I think in Orlando, it's about 10% of the property. If that, that's not, it's, that's high. Um, it, it's just not as affected as you think they are um, in the, in the apartment world. They're just not. So what we try to do, but what I think is going to happen with, them, with those people is you're going to get some downturn in occupancy. This happened in the 08, 09 recession when uh, everybody lost their jobs. Unemployment then went to 10%. If you remember, I don't know how many of you were around then. But what happened is kids moved back in with parents. Boyfriend, girlfriend moved in together, even though they probably shouldn't have. So you saw some consolidation in the housing market. So there was a little bit less demand. But I'm, I'm not particularly concerned about it in Florida because we have we still have people moving to Florida for the very same reasons that have, they've moved to Florida for years and years and years. That's not going to change and hasn't been changing. So I don't know that if they stop the stimulus payments, it's going to be the end <clears throat> for us. Uh, not at all. I think the aggravation right now for me is that we're being we're being forced to support people who genuinely probably don't deserve or need it, uh, but we're being forced to let them live in our place free. Um, and when I think there could be other ways to subsidize them, but they're, but they're not, they're just legislating that we have to do it. Um, so if stimulus were to stop in a month, how worried would I be? I wouldn't be too worried because those people are gonna go find, they gotta solve their problem. We're gonna help them go find another place to live, whether it be with a friend or whatever and uh, there's going to be people there to backfill them. And I know that because that's the situation we're in now with the virus. And we have squatters. We're ha we have full properties. We have people wanting to move in. We can't move them in because of the squatters. So that's why we, we are pushing the squatters out so we can get the new people in. It's happening now. Um, and I suspect that it will happen then. OK, thanks. Uh couple more questions. This one from Chris. Uh, what we're seeing lately in Florida are uh, properties that are self-managed. Can the owner employs two or three staff on a property or a local individual manages a property without a management fee? The P&L shows wages but no management fee. If we're to acquire such properties, how can we bring in a management company where the property will not support the management fee, which is 50k or higher, I suppose? So let me make sure I understand the question. A property self-managed and so they have employees on site just like they would if they were third party managed, correct? Who, gets, who asked the question? I think it was Chris, right? Yeah, yep. I did. I did. Okay. So now your concern is how can you buy that property and afford to have a third party manager in place? Yeah, how can I how can I layer in a huge um, fee on that uh, on the on the PL? You know, it's going to be about 50, you know, between 40 and $60,000. Now I know, you know, one way to look at it is, is 
how can you afford not to? I, you know, I, I agree with that. It's taken on a risk if you, if you leave that manager in place. But if they've been managing pretty well for, I don't know, five, 10 years, you know, how do I get another, how do I get a professional in there um, without blowing up the deal? Sure. So how many units are we talking about roughly? Let's call it a hundred. A hundred. And you have three people on site? Two, one inside, one outside. Okay. Well, that's normal. That's what you should have. And what you're suggesting is that the, the owner um, managed that property with those two people. And your question is how could a, a guy like me come in and how could you afford to have a guy like me come in? Yeah. And, and I want you to come in. I, I'm not, I'm not saying I don't, I do, <laughs> no, 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 I, I know want that. you there, <laughs> but how do I, what, 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 you know, other than, you know, um, raising the rents 50%, which I don't think I can do. I'd like to, yeah. but I can't. No, um, no, no. How, how do we make that work? Yeah. So a couple of things. First of all, th that owner is getting paid to manage the property. It's not sh just not showing up on your P and L. And if he's not, shame on him. I mean, he's, he's got to value his or her time, right? I mean, there is work involved in managing a property. So well, I, I'm assuming that the cash flow distributions that he's getting off that property are basically paying, his, paying him for that work. Um, I would submit to you that any lender that you work with is going to underwrite your deal as if they have to have third-party management in place. Whether it's you, whether it's me, they still know that there's work involved and there's a fee that ha you have to be paid for work. So you, if, whether you're gonna pay yourself to do that work or you're gonna pay me to do that work, it doesn't matter. It's still gonna become part of the P&L. Now what you'll find is, you know, again, he's managed his own property, he's had it for years and years, he's got room, right? He doesn't have the size mortgage that you're about to put on the property. So that usually becomes the issue. I would submit to you that you need to, you need to underwrite the deal the way you're going to run the deal. And if it doesn't make sense, then you shouldn't buy it. Full yep. stop. That's just, um, that's how Brad can, would approach it. Related but different, that, yeah, re related but different question to that, Ken. Am I on mute? Um, no, I can hear you, yep. Yeah, okay. So, um, uh, apologies, in, in your buyer, I put 2,000 doors, but you have a lot more experience than 2,000 doors, so we'll, we'll correct that in the, uh, in the, in the edit. Um, uh, so I last night I made an offer for a small 16 unit in in in, in St. Pete. Uh, hopefully we'll get that uh, nice syndication deal. And because I don't I don't live there full time, I, I was looking at a management company, and the company that I was looking at actually has about like a, a 800 doors and 600 he owns, right? Uh, okay. So in the same area. So my thinking is: is there a conflict if I gave it to him? Because if he's got a great tenant, why would he give it to me first? Right, the tenant that's willing to pay thirteen hundred versus eleven hundred, he's going to put his own apartments. Mm -hmm. uh, in your case with KRI, when we do larger deals, you're also an owner. Uh, how do we get around that conflict of interest? Yeah, so that's a really good question, and I deal with it all the time. Um, let's. Uh, there's a lot of different scenarios this can take, but here's how I deal with conflict. First of all, remember I'm a CPA by background, so in my upbringing, I was taught not only to manage actual conflict, but also manage the perception of, of there being a conflict. So I, I, I go a little step further to make sure that you, you couldn't even, uh, you couldn't figure out that there is a conflict, right? There's no way. So the way I do it, I give two property managers, two different cell phones, two different phone numbers, two different advertising methodologies, whatever those might be, and there's no conflict. I don't get to decide where they go. I just don't. Now, more often than not, I will tell you, I've managed properties next to properties I own. It, and this, this comes to, you got to figure out who the person is that you're working with. My clients have always benefited before mine. My properties have always been hurt. If I have to send a maintenance guy to do a turn, do I send them to my property, the guys next door? It's the guy next door that always gets it first. It's just how I operate. You're, you, you'll, you would only know that if you had been with me for a while. Now, 16 units is hard. It's hard for somebody to manage 16 units. I can't yeah, put anybody the, on the, site. That's not the question. It's, it's not the size issue. It's really more, more of you, you're an owner, you're competing for deals. Mm -hmm. And if you own the 200 doors next to my 200 doors, um, and, you know, and they're both at 95% occupancy, 
the, the next five tenants, the good tenants, you know, how do I know that you're, you're going to place it in mine versus yours? Yeah. And what I just said is what I do. I, I make it so I have nothing to do with where that resident goes. I give property A, their phone number, their cell phone, their own advertising, property B, same thing. Now, does it make sense to kind of price them near each other or relative to each other? The, the tenants will figure that out on their own, right? If your property is nicer, but it's cheaper, they're gonna to go to your property. I mean, it's just, the, it, the I, I'm not gonna be able to control that, nor would I want to. Um, it actually, in your case, that would help you. That would help because if, if my property was nicer than yours, I would, I would do my best to, to get your rent up as much as possible. But again, I don't make the decision about where a tenant goes. I, I try to take it out of my hands by running them separately, building that little wall between them, saying if the, if the resident calls that cell phone number, it's your property. If the resident calls this cell phone number, it's Amanda's property or my property. That's just how we do it. We deal with that conflict all the time. And it does. it's not necessarily whether I'm involved in owning a property. We have that situation constantly with different clients that are near each other. And that's how we deal with it. Because there's no other okay. fair way to do it. There's just no other way to do it. Okay. We'll have to trust you. And you, you're very trustworthy, we can tell. <laughs> but you have to, I mean, uh, that's any manager that you have, you have to, and watch it. Just keep an eye on it. And, and there's nothing wrong with shopping your manager to see what happens. Sure. Uh, there's a question from, uh, sorry, just moving on. There's a question from Jim uh, on what you're seeing uh, from yourself and your clients, uh, in particular Central Florida uh, cap rate trends. Yeah, it's uh, it's been in the early, the low fives, uh, depending on the neighborhood. You, you can sometimes get something close to a six. Um, but it's usually in the low fives. And I, I don't have a good feel for what it's been since COVID. I mean, people are expecting the COVID discount. <laughs> they just are. And now the question is, will the seller give that to you or not? Uh, it just depends on how motivated they are to sell. So it's, it's in the high fives. But what I would encourage yeah. you to do is remember, you're, you, especially Brad's people, you, you, have a, you have a formula that you have to meet. So you can actually calculate the cap rate that you can't go below in order to make your deal work. It's, yeah, it's really- I think, I think, Yeah, I think that the question is more of what you're seeing in terms of trends. Are you seeing any trend downs uh, yet or are you, are you not seeing any? I think the question is more of the trends. What, yeah, the trends what? has been generally down. Hmm. Okay, so, so really, I mean, we know real estate's lagging. Maybe the question is for the group here Real estate is definitely lagging versus stocks. You know, it takes a bit longer. In your experience, Ken, and others, how many months, you know, if this continues, how many months does it lag before it gets, uh, we see better pricing? Anybody yeah. have experience in the last downturn? Yeah. Are, are, we, are we waiting yeah. another month? Is it not a, a six months? What, what? Uh, it's, I think six to 12 months is what I think before we have a meaningful adjustment to price. But here's, uh, and I know you didn't ask this question, but I want to just raise this point. People oftentimes get hung up on going in cap rates. Well, if you're in a market like Cleveland, you need to care a lot about your going in cap rate because the big upside isn't there. Instead, I have watched some very, very smart people buy at a three cap going in. Why? You think you're nuts. Why on earth would you do that? Because they know what kind of value is going to be there when they're done. So I actually encourage people, and this is counter to what I did for the first 12 years of my investing life, it, I, it was all about, you better go in cheap, you better go in on good price or you're gonna get killed, right? Well, it actually turns out in a market that, that is growing like Florida is, you gotta back into what you're willing to pay. Go figure out where can I get rents if I do what I'm gonna do to this property, where can I get rents? That puts my value at what? Then figure out how much it's gonna take to get there, figure out what my return requirements are, and then that'll leave you with your price that you can afford to pay. Now, sometimes that leads you to a price that you're paying the buy the seller for some of the value you're creating. And I'm not I'm not going to recommend that people go out and do that, but sometimes it's okay to do that because the upside is so great. Who cares if you give a little bit of it to the seller because you're in a competitive environment trying to get a deal, and sure. everybody knows that. So sure. consider looking at your deal differently sometimes rather than just the going in cap rate. Okay. 
Uh, Greg, you, you had two questions. The, one of them I didn't quite understand. Do you mind me mind just kind of asking it directly to to Ken? Greg? Sure, absolutely. Um, there's really only one. I think the other one was a comment. But the, my question was whether um, you guys are seeing the the rent boycott movement at all there in Central Florida, uh, and if so, how uh, how are y'all handling that on your properties? Yeah, the rent boycott movement. Yes, sir. No, you called it. Yeah, we're not. We're not having a rent boycott movement, uh, not that I've heard, other than the folks who feel, now it's interesting, the protection they believe they're getting, which, which they are getting, is, is very publicized by uh, Governor DeSantis ha putting a ban on evictions and that ban is supposed to expire tomorrow. I guarantee it's gonna get extended, all right? but. That is well publicized, very, very well publicized. Most residents don't even understand the moratorium put in place by CARES. I've never had anyone bring it up to me. Well, I'm sorry, I've had one tenant talk to us about that. Excuse me. Everybody th looks at DeSantis's eviction moratorium and, and that's what they, they're using. Interestingly enough, the last time right before it got extended, it was uh, June, uh, July, June 1, I think. Or, or May 31st, I can't remember the exact date. The weekend before that was set to expire, we actually had people coming into our office with three, four, five thousand dollars wanting to pay up their rents. Why? Because they were concerned that the governor wasn't going to extend that moratorium. And they were concerned that if that moratorium expired, they had a big balance. We started the eviction process. We don't have to take rent. And they were very scared of losing their homes. What they were doing was hoarding cash because they were worried. They don't know, just like we don't know what's going to come ahead. They were hoarding cash. So we'll see. I don't think it's happening this time because I think they really expect it to get extended. So we'll see. So I have not seen any rent boycott other than this, the few people who just feel that we can't touch them. Um, I will tell you that law that passed the House, they were considering what did they call it? It's a rent waiver, something like that, where we, we weren't even allowed to charge rent. Um, I don't think that made it into the house bill, which is really just criminal. I mean, that forces us to give something away for free forever, and that's just absurd. So we haven't heard anything about that yet. I told you about the rent freeze movement. They got squashed pretty quickly. Um, we don't wanna see any of that. I mean, that ran every investor out of New York City, everyone. Trust me, they're all calling my phone want to invest in Florida because they're so angry that they can't figure out how to make money now in their market. Good question. Uh, Ken, I'll just ask, uh, th thank you for that. I just have one more question and maybe we can go back to, to finishing some of the great slides. Um, uh, one of the students that couldn't make it wanted me to ask, uh, 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 first, what, what markets are you in in Central Florida in terms of properties that you manage? And then, are there certain markets that you'd like more than others and why? Yeah, good question. Certain sub markets within sub Central. Sure. So we're, we're in the Tampa, all over the Tampa, St. Pete, Clearwater market. We're all throughout Orlando. We're in Daytona and we're in uh, Jacksonville. Um, which market do I look like the best? Um, Pre-COVID, I would have told you Orlando was first, Tampa was second, Jacksonville third, Daytona fourth. Post-COVID, I would say Tampa is first. Orlando, I would probably go to Jacksonville second. I would probably put Orlando down in third and Daytona probably still fourth. And it has more to do with the diversity of the employment base. That's really, really a big deal. Huge deal. Great. Don't underestimate that. That and the competition of properties around you. For example, we have a property in the south side of Jacksonville that if, if I hit a good driver, I can hit five different properties near me. That's a lot of competition. Very hard to move rents there. We're still able to do it. And, and it's, it's happening because the whole market is being bought and improved just like it's happening throughout Florida. But I contrast that to a property we have in Orange City. I mean, who, who's ever even heard of Orange City? But it's a small property just off I-4, northeast of Orlando. And there's no competition anywhere. We don't, we don't, we blink and we have a new resident and at $100 higher rents. $200 higher rent. So pay attention to competition when you're looking at these things. Sometimes you don't think it matters much. It's huge. So economic diversity on the employment base 
and the number of competitors in that immediate market. Pay attention to those two things. Very good. Okay, okay, I'm gonna throw down one more. So I, I just I just spent a whole month there full time without the kids. I was out looking at the, the time for MSA every single day, at least four or five hours a day driving around. Uh, Jim was there with me and I felt like I still didn't get the market. So within Tampa Bay MSA, can you throw down in terms of uh, their specific markets or zip codes even that you like and why? Yeah, I don't, I don't commit the zip codes to memory, but um, <laughs> I won't do that. A anywhere, come on, um, Ken. <laughs> anywhere in the St. Pete, Clearwater area, I love that whole area. Um, I don't know, I'm trying to think of an area. Um, there are, the farther north you go of Tampa, it's not that it's bad, it's not bad. It is slow, it, it slows down. You're, mm. You've got a different clientele. So what happens in our business how many times have you heard someone say, I, I want to get in the path of growth, right? Because I'm going to get in before the prices go up. But then you are looking at deals that are in the path of growth. They don't look so pretty. It's, it's hard to have that foresight to say, wait a minute, that's in the path of growth. That's probably, if you're looking up at Newport Richie, there's a deal on the market now in Newport Richie. I'm sure you've, you've all seen it. Um, Newport Ritchie is kind of in the path of growth, maybe, right? There's no place for at Tampa to grow. It's got to grow either toward Orlando, which it has been doing like crazy. Look at Lakeland, look at all those markets between Tampa and Orlando. It's hard to find a tough market there. I'll, I'll buy in any one of those markets. And now the only problem north of Tampa has up there with Pasco County is the number of sinkholes. Sinkholes scare me. Um, I almost did a deal there once and Somehow, I don't remember how, I discovered that, there, oh, there was a sinkhole that was repaired. And after I did a lot more research, I figured out, not so much. Um, they did all the right things, but the, you know, the year after I passed on it, somebody else bought it and almost lost the whole building to a sinkhole. So Northern Pasco, you gotta be careful up there because of the sinkholes, it's just the way the ground is. Uh, but otherwise, I love all, all parts of Tampa. You're hard pressed to, you're hard pressed to find an area right, that I don't right, like. Right. Just stay out okay. of the, the battle zones. That's all I ask that you do. I don't. I won't. Gotcha. Do gotcha. Okay. Uh, Ken, I think you've got a few more great slides. This is uh, maybe we'll we'll, we'll, uh, we'll ask you to to finish those and we'll come back to discussions just to make stuff sure. a little bit. All Thank right. You. Let me uh, bear with my technical lack of expertise here. Yeah, we're, we're just about an hour. If you, if you don't mind, I'd love to just. Keep going to to five thirty if you have the time and, and the audience. It's just really good Q and A here. Sure, sure. I'm yeah. I don't think I have too much left here. Um, okay. Let's see here. I think we went through that. Okay. Yeah, we don't have much left. Um, Simon, what in your previous agenda, you had asked me to look at short, medium, and long term uh, yep. for Florida, Central Florida. Short term, I think, you know, I probably sent this message pretty good right now. It's really, really volatile. You just, it's like riding a roller coaster. I don't like roller coasters, quite honestly, um, but it is what it is. I mean, there's a lot of government intervention going on, and you just got to be nimble, and that's what we're doing, and we're, we're doing okay. I, I think most of our clients are happy with the Ken, are you actively buying now? Not at the moment. I, I, okay. I, if I find something that falls in my lap, yep. Um, I think okay. though about a year out is the time. Okay. One of the things that so I have to manage is my conflict with you guys. If I know you guys are looking at a deal, I won't. Okay, I won't. But, but, but since you're in both businesses, I'm sure you're very good at both. The fact that you're not actively buying and more focused on the PM side is indicative of, of your own preferences. Yes, although that's going to change. I'm preparing to be buy a buyer in six to 12 months. Remember I told you that's when it was going to change. That's yep. what I think. Gotcha. That's gotcha. what I think. Okay. Um, so the medium term, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I just don't know how long it's going to last. Uh, the long term, I'll, um, you know, there's a story. There's a company, I won't name it. Um, they came into the market in 2011 when everybody was running it out. They were running. The market was terrible. Nobody wanted to touch Florida with a 10 foot pole. They went in with $100 million and bought everything in sight, everything they could find. They just bought, 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 bought. They have been selling for the last two years. I'm pretty certain they turned that $100 million into over a billion dollars in equity. I'm certain of it. There's no way they couldn't have. 
based on what I saw in prices. And uh, I wouldn't, I do believe that we're about to have another one of those opportunities. Um, I mm. couldn't participate in the last one because unfortunately for me, I had gone through a divorce at that time and you just don't buy real estate when you're going through a divorce, probably a bad idea. But um, if, if, you know, I think this is going to be my last opportunity and, and a very important opportunity for all of us to get in. And there's plenty down there to go around. Don't, don't sweat it. Um, but you, you just get in and ride the, ride the wave back up. So um, I'm very, very bullish uh, on Florida. Um, let's see. If you all want to keep in touch, I would love it if you did. Um, LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, you know what? And don't laugh. I am starting to embrace social media because uh, my kids, are, that's all they ever do. I think it's important to get our message out. Um, if you're interested in, in uh, our company profile, um, feel free. It's, uh, it's in that link there. I'll put it in the chat box so that everybody can get it. Um, and then uh, I have, uh, if you're interested, I have, we use, uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, market analytics. It's a real page product. Um, we used to use CoStar. I don't do them anymore because I just got frustrated with their rent comps being so bad. Um, so we use market analytics. There's a 89 page report. It's the Tampa St. Pete Clearwater area. First quarter, if you want it, it's there. You can download it. It's too big a file for me to email to everybody. Um, so you're, you're welcome to go do that. All you have to do is just join my list, my email list. And if you don't want to get emailed from me, just unsubscribe. I don't care. I just want to, I had to have a way to get you the, the report if you want it. Excuse me, that's a lot of very, very good trend stuff. And if you don't know much about RealPage, RealPage is just gobbling up every software company they can find. And their goal is to touch every property they can so that when they sell data to you and me through these market analytics reports, it's real data based on real information that's aggregated, okay? They won't give up their clients' information, but it's real data that you can really use. And what you're gonna find is a lot of discussion in that report, then if, if you think about when it was published early April, there were a lot of predictions about which markets would be the most affected by COVID and everything. So it's an interesting read. I didn't read all 89 pages of it, but there's a lot of good stuff there to, you know, I know your, your, Great. your investors are always looking for that stuff. So, and then yeah. can point, we get a copy of that as well as your PPT, Ken? Say again. Can we get a copy of both, both the PPT as well as the, that, that market report? The, yeah, the yeah, first... right there in the link. Fantastic, so me, fantastic. I will, yeah. I'm going to unshare my screen now and yeah. I'm going to figure out how. Oh, no, it's okay. You, you, can, you can email me that later. If you, if you have another few more minutes, there's a few more questions. I that Maybe we can just keep, keep okay. Uh, I really wanted to know the minimum number of units you would take on. You want to know what? I'm sorry? The minimum units you would take on in the property. Yeah, that's a good, good question. Um, it's not, it's less about me and it's more about what you can afford. Um, you can't afford me on a 16 unit. I, I'm just being honest. You just can't, there's no room. Um, when you start getting below 50 units, it gets hard. It gets hard okay. and it, it just is because our model is dependent on having someone in, on site and having, you know, we're, we're managing the property as if we're in your shoes. Great. Okay. Chris has the same question. Great question. Do you see any amenities, uh, amenities or property characteristics that residents value more than others? Again, in, maybe in particular in, in, in Florida um, that we should be thinking about. Yeah. So there's, and you'll learn the problem with asking me a question is I get long winded. Um, the in unit amenities, I, I place a huge value of washer dryer in the units. If you can do that, that is huge because without it, you, you put a ceiling on your rents because above a certain price point, I won't take my laundry to a laundry facility. I just won't do it. I won't live there, right? Um, but if you can put the, un the, the facilities in my unit, guess what? Now I'll pay more rent. So you just open up, uh, that's, that's huge. Obviously all the other appliances, um, you just need your units to look neat, clean, and modern, right? Don't go crazy with all the stuff the broker wants you to do. Talk to me before you renovate, all right? Because you don't need to spend all the money they want you to spend. Exterior-wise, I always try to figure out, remember I talked about this grabbing them emotionally? Think about you're a prospect. You're, mark, you're going to that property. You have to have something about it that says to you, wow, this is a really cool place. 
And I like to do that by creating little destinations. Um, I like to put in, if we have a pool, I like to put in an outdoor grills, gas power grills, so you have an outdoor kitchen. I like to have outdoor TVs, hopefully near the fitness center. So when you think about it, when your leasing agent's walking someone around, they can tell the story of, mom, I, I'm just making this up here, mom working out in the fitness center, well, dad's watching the kids cooking dinner and watching the Florida game uh, on the TV. Think about that. And then, we, you know, maybe putting a playground nearby. So I try to build amenities in combination with one another so that they make sense, right? <clears throat> I don't like putting the dog run the other side of the property from the playground, right? Well, <laughs> not, <laughs> that's not cool, right? You, you want to put it together. So all those amenities that you can come up, people in Florida, they love their dogs. They just do. You've got to have a pool if your property is any size at all. Um, don't worry about your tennis court. If you have a tennis court, you can get rid of it and get something good in there. Make it into your dog park or something because nobody uses tennis courts at 95 degrees. They just don't. Um, and just think of new ways to get people cool play. Fire pits are another really big deal. Um, wow. They don't use them much, but I'm telling you, you're gra what you do, when we teach our leasing people, we want you to start at the amenity package outside and just show them how cool a place this is and tell that little story I just told you. Then when you get them to the units, you, you, all you have to do when you get to the unit is not screw it up, right? And the reason, I know that you laugh, but the reason that's important is every dollar you spend in a unit, if it's 100 units, you're spending it 100 times. That gets really expensive really fast. If I can accomplish my emotional goal with an exterior improvement, I do that because I only do it once. And it accomplishes the same thing for every resident. I see it sometimes where people try to renovate from the inside out. Please don't do that. All the money you spent, all the value you created, all the beautiful things you did are sitting behind a locked door and I can't even get the resident to the front door because the rest of the place looks like hell. So please, whatever you do, do it from the outside in and just build that little amenity package, whatever you can do uh, to build that. It's, it's gonna serve you very, very well. Great, great. There's at least two more questions. Um, uh, I think it was Jim asking about southern part of Tampa, uh, Bradington, Sarasota. Uh, mm -hmm. Your thoughts on those markets? They're growing. Nothing wrong with them. Okay. Love Bradenton. Love Bradenton. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Uh, Amanda, you had a question about, uh, I think, uh, she's a question, what do you see as the major tailwinds for the Tampa MSA in the next couple of years? Tailwind or headwind? Is it a difference? Let me see. What, what's the difference? Uh, headwind, I'm I think. Pushing right? you along, one stopping you. Which one, Amanda? Yeah, yeah. I think I think you meant headwind, right? Or did I did I read that wrong? I guess challenges, Amanda. Shake your head. Or, or yeah, challenges. Yeah, challenges. Challenge. Yeah. You know what? We haven't even talked about this challenge. The biggest challenge we face every single day is finding good employees. This is a major battle. It. You would think. Why on earth could you be having trouble when there's 15% unemployment? Well, right now there's an unemployment bonus of like $600 a week. I mean, it's absurd. We're, we're, we've, we've always had a trouble finding good people. And so the only thing I want you to do when you underwrite some of these properties, I used to be able to tell you, oh, you could probably get away with 900 a door on your payroll. I can't anymore because I can't find good people to work for that. I just can't because it's too darn competitive out there. So that's my number one headwind is people. It's just we can't find them. It's just really hard. We have to pay up for them. We do. We have an incredible benefits package that's actually not very expensive, but it's really cool for the employees. We, we have one of the few companies that have a 401k match. It, you know, we have the flexible spending account. We, every one of our full-time people get short and long-term disability as well as 50,000 of life insurance. We do all that <clears throat> we, we're, we use a PEO called HROI. That's a lot of acronyms, sorry. Uh, a professional employer organization. They have about 100, 150,000 employees that they work with different companies. So we're able to get access to Fortune 500 level benefits. But there's no way my 50 person employee uh, company could get access to those benefits. So that's how we're fighting that battle. But employees, number one battle, no question. Other than that, um, Other than that, <clears throat> it's the market isn't having an issue. 
um, just making sure people underwrite carefully and don't get themselves we've all underwritten deals, right? And all of a sudden, oh, I can shave here, I can shave there, I can shave here, I can shave there. Next thing you know, the deal pencils out, but I can't, I can't make it happen. So be careful about that. That's, that's a big sure. headwind that I see a lot of inexperienced people do. Uh, Greg, maybe you can unmute and uh, I know you wanted to drill down some very specific questions. Those are great questions. Maybe you could uh, share that with us. Yeah, sure. Uh, following on that note, um, Ken, uh, so obviously payroll is going to be higher than we might be used to in some parts of the country. Um, what other expenses can you see being different, whether higher or lower than, you know, other parts of the country just in general that we, we might have been looking at? Yeah, so I think payroll is an issue everywhere. I mean, I talk to people all over the country and they're all fighting the same battle. They just are. Florida is a little hard because it's grown like crazy. Um, we are in Arizona too. Say again? We are in Arizona too. Yep. Okay. Same thing. Yep. And I think they're fighting it in Dallas too. My Dallas friends tell me the same thing. Um, what other parts of the P&L are you going to watch? Insurance. I think this is across the country. I'm pretty good friends with an insur a wholesaler that a lot of people use. Um, I, we actually taught him to fly back in the day. Uh, and now he still flies to all his, uh, his clients. But he, uh, he tells me that the, re the um, what are the mood is the, what do you what do you call the guys that rate the rating agencies the rating agencies went to the insurance industry and said listen guys i know you for 20 30 years you've not made money on your core business we cannot continue to give you these incredible ratings when you don't even make a dime on your core business and you rely on investments uh your investment income to make up the difference and become a profitable company so he indicated to me that that conversation was going on. So the whole market was, had to adjust their pricing because they had to now make money on their core business. I haven't talked to him since COVID hit. I don't know if the rating agencies backed off of that because the last thing we need is another reason to beat down the rating agents, you know, to beat down a company. But that's one thing. And then uh, I think that the market has tightened up a little bit in Florida. We had a few hurricanes over the last few years what happens, it's very, it's very cyclical to the insurance business. So when everybody gets fat, dumb, and happy, right, it's kind of a crude way to say that they're making money hand over fist, new guys come into the market. They buy market share by driving the price down. We love that. And the prices come down. And then a few hurricanes hit. <laughs> they bail because now they, they lost a bunch of money. And they bail. Then, they, then we have fewer buy, buyer. We have fewer people to buy from. Price goes back up. So we're kind of in that upswing right now. Um, you know, it used to be I could get you insured for 350 a door. Now it's probably closer to 450. It's just the last number that I'm using when I'm underwriting. So that's an important one that you want to watch. Other than that, I don't think anything crazy is uh, going on. I mean, the biggest changes we're making right now are on the income side, and they're all positive. I mean, we're literally trying to invent reasons to charge people for things in that growing market. I mean, we charge them for trash, we charge them for parking, we charge them for just damn near everything. And uh, if Matt's still on the call, I don't think he is, but Matt will tell you he's operating in a market like Cleveland. That isn't how it goes in Cleveland. You're praying to God you can get a tenant. And, I'm sorry, did you say 350 or 450 a door is a good planning figure? For 450 now. Yeah, okay. Yep. All right. Yep. yep, that's assuming they've got a clean history. If they've got a bunch of losses, that's a different story. Sure. Yeah, uh, Arun just talked in a great question that I actually I, I have as well. Thanks, Arun. Uh, how much do taxes go up in general in the Florida market? I do hear different things. Uh, the 16 unit, for example, if I if I talk to the county, they're using the, the mill rate and whatnot. But then some of the brokers are saying uh, they're actually much more easygoing and more following the comps. Is a huge difference in terms the of brokers are what? following comps. Now, here's what the brokers should be doing, and the big brokers know this. You're going to take your sales price. You're going to multiply it now somewhere between 85 and 75 percent, somewhere in there. They don't know exactly yes. what that number is going to be. Now, apply the millage rate. Add your non-ad valorem taxes. That's what your taxes are going to go to. That's yeah. It. So. Yeah, and specifically for this smaller one, uh, the broker and the property management company that owns similar units in area says that it wouldn't go up that high in St. Pete. It's in St. Pete. In fact, they would uh, that count that county would actually look at the comps as well. 
I'm, I'm not sure if that's true. Uh, that's from the PM telling me that. Yeah, so here's what I would do. I would talk to uh, somebody who practices law in that area. As you know, I'm not an attorney. Um, I, I'd tell you how I would underwrite it. Um, I've never heard anyone say yes. that. I mean, are they supposed to look at comps? But think about this. Their job is to figure out what the fair va market value of your property is and tax it accordingly. Well, you just bought the property. I mean, how do you get a better proxy for value than yeah. what a exactly, unknown, exactly. I mean, unrelated yeah. people just got together and decided on a price. No one's under duress. I don't know how you can dispute that. So now, I, I've not known too many jurisdictions to leave money on the table. I mean, may, maybe it's true. Uh, okay, I, yeah. I don't. I don't so, know. Yeah, I've never I actually, like actually, I had it twice, and so I think in general is what Greg just typed. Uh, Florida is basically like like Texas reassess, and that's in general. But in this 16 unit deal, the PM owns a similar building within four blocks from there, and he's saying, based on his experience, it, it wasn't it wasn't what you just said. And then uh, we made an offer a few weeks ago for a 46 unit in Clearwater, and the broker also said something similar that in that county they actually don't go up as high as it is, and they make some concessions. But again, so I just wanted to double check that. I, I'm not sure if that's the same question as Arun asking, but but yeah. I, I had two instances where, where I had a, a similar content. So let me ask you, uh, who is the broker in the 46 unit? Um, it wasn't CBR. It was, a. Uh, I think it was Marcus. Marcus Which Milichek. One? Was it um, Louis? Casey? God. Um, no, young guy. Well, they're all now. They're yeah, all let young. me pick it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> let me pick you back on that. Yeah. Okay. It would be nice to know. It would be nice to, because it makes a huge difference. Uh, it does. Yeah. And I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I would, okay. I would just okay. encourage Let, let's, you to We'll take that offline. We'll take that offline. Yeah. I don't um, want to see you get burned. I mean, the questions keep coming in. Uh, maybe we'll just take one more. I, I don't want you to always stay your welcome. Uh, we, we don't want to always stay your generosity. Let's no worries. See. I'm uh, happy to talk. I think uh, any energy deregulated there, can you negotiate electricity contracts or is it monopolized? Uh, this is uh, Arun, I think, asking about Tampa. Wh which one? What, what's the uh, question? Is energy deregulated uh, there? Oh. Uh, and uh, can you negotiate electricity contracts or is it monopolized? Yeah, good question. Um, first of all, electricity, well, you can buy your electricity from a, a supplier just like you can everywhere else. That's not an issue. Um, the the savings to be had in the energy world <clears throat> is a swap out your common area stuff for LEDs. And they're happy to do that and save you a lot of money. I, I would encourage people to do that. Um, inside your units, you just need to have your property management company actively manage your vacants. You cannot turn off the air conditioner in Florida in the summertime, you just can't. You'll have mold everywhere. So. They just have to turn up the temperature. They have to turn off the hot water heater that's most likely in the unit. Why on earth do you want to heat hot water for nobody when they don't live there? So turn that off and then your refrigerator, clean it out, unplug it, open the doors. That's all you need to do. So now you're vacant, burning very little energy. So uh, I've not spent a lot of time managing my electric bill because it's a really relatively small port part of my uh, p and I do spend more time managing water um, because that's a bigger component. Although almost every property in Florida passes it through. But having said that, if I've got a property that is extraordinarily high water bills, I wanna find out why, because it's gonna hurt my ability to rent. People don't realize it going in, but it sure, they certainly do make renewal decisions based on that. So I will go through and do the toilets. You can get a 0 0.6 Niagara Stealth now, which is incredibly, uh, well, it's an expensive product, but it saves you a ton of money. And then take all your, uh, you use a half gallon needle spray in the bathroom, you use a one and a half bubble spray in the kitchen and you use 175 on the shower and you're fine. That you've done as much as you can. And it's a relatively, other than the toilet, it's a relatively inexpensive project. Great. great. I've spent more time okay. on the water though. Okay, uh, we're just gonna wrap this up. We, we've always stayed the, the hour. Ken, this has been amazing. I personally love long form uh, podcasts and interviews as opposed to this, a lot of the social media, 10 second fake news. And, and this has been an amazing learning experience. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Uh, we, we will post a video on YouTube to the Sunrock group 
first, and then I'm a little backlog. We'll have an intern, one of my intern analysts, uh, turn this into in the podcast. And uh, perhaps after you review, you're okay with it. We'll also post this into the wizard site, which is a bit more public. Uh, and we'll also attempt to do a one or two page summary of this uh, learning today as well. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, really, no, really thank appreciate you. it. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you for joining us. Please visit Wizards Institute to access the blog summary of today's session, to learn more about other speakers, and to network with other investment wizards. Wizards Institute, the number one community to learn smart investing and financial freedom.